feeling of coming in the gym, I'm getting the feeling of coming at home, I'm getting the feeling of coming backstage when I pump up, when I pose out in front of 5,000 people, I get the same feeling. So I'm coming day and night. I mean, it's terrific, right? <laughs> Crom, I've never prayed to you before. But what pleases you, Crom? So grant me one request. Grant me revenge. Sayun, everyone. My name is The Fisherman, and welcome back to the show. I apologize for the absence, but you know, real life does require attention as well. So, uh, every now and then. Anyway, in this video, we will look into the Manchu and form the Qing. As always, I will start with some historical nerdy stuff, and then the opening moves, and, and finally uh, the ideas and synergies. Forming the Qing as one of the Yurchin tribes will give you the, a Manchurian candidate achievement. And claiming the Mandate of Heaven will give you the Qing of China achievement. So even though I will be doing the former in this video just to show it to you, I would strongly recommend not doing this. Uh, unless you are explicitly going for the achievements. Otherwise it is uh, preferable to stay a horde for as long as possible. Which I will explain uh, later. Other than that, the achievements are pretty straightforward. But first, uh, a brief historical context. So there is this guy, Nurhachi. Uh, he united the Yurchin tribes to the northeast of China, just as we are going to do today. And when a <laughs> rival chieftain killed Nurhachi's father and grandfather, he set on a quest to avenge them, and thereby almost by accident united the other tribes. Uh, the name of this rival chieftain, however, is Nikan Wailan, which translates into Secretary of the Han Chinese in the Yurchin language, so this is already a bit of an intriguing uh, situation. Uh, furthermore, the element of avenging his, your killed father and uniting the tribes because you are the strongest warrior and thereby earning the other tribes their respect uh, seems really similar to that of the story of Genghis Khan. Thus, it seems likely that these are actually tropes that appear in the mythologies of great tribal leaders rising to power. You know, it, it are those kinds of nuances that actually make the study of history both important and fun, uh, at least in my opinion. But anyway, you people came here for entertainment and, and crushing the Ming soldiers beneath your horses, so here we go. So actually, this entire strategy is predicated upon the fact that you can just declare war on the Ming in 1445, you know, in the first year of, of actually playing the game. Most videos and suggestions I have come across, however, actually they, they just deal with uniting the other Manchu tribes first and only then focusing your effort on the Ming and where you hopefully get the unguarded nomadic frontier event before Ming overpowers you, yada yada yada. Uh, so, however, I actually found that that version was way more risky and also less fun uh, than the strategy I will showcase in this video. So instead, we're going to deal with the problem directly and just attack Ming as soon as we can. So, alrighty then, uh, let's get going. So, uh, the first thing we do is exploit development in the provinces to gain sailors, uh, which we can then use to build three heavy ships for the, an artillery barrage later on. So, you raise the banners, raise the host, Get a good general if the race host didn't give you a good one. Hire a military advisor and an administrative advisor if you fancy. Mm, don't worry about the money though, because money won't be a problem for now, because defeating the Ming and taking all of, it of their money and war reps will cover all of the expenses that we're going to make during this war. Uh, I found out that if you take war reps from the Ming, you actually get like 5.8 gold a month, which is huge. It gives definitely gives you a lot of more breathing space. Uh, during testing, however, I noticed something interesting, and that is that you can snipe the Hyksi before they become Ming's tributary, if you're a bit lucky. If you make all of your preparation before unpausing the game, and then pause the game again at 12 December, then the Hyksi won't have joined Ming yet, some of some uh, occasionally. And they're all alone, so making them the perfect first target. Besides, you need their lands anyway for the future, so you can opt to take this as your first move as well, because the idea is that we wait for the Ming to declare their usually usual tributary war on the Oirat and Mongolia. If they do so, then you declare your own war on the Ming. This will give you the slight benefit of the Ming having to split their forces over the multiple wars. And furthermore, what I noticed was that if you go for Hyksi first, 
then Ming will almost always wait with declaring the tributary war on Oirat until you have made uh, until you have conquered Haixi. If you don't take too long, of course. So the timing is pretty pretty ideal. Anyway, we uh, here it didn't work, so we're going to attack the Ming. Uh, you you siege down Xiangyang, and then you go for Beijing. Uh, fight the Ming troops in open terrain as much as you can, so steps, grasslands, etc. Because you need it. You shouldn't be too afraid of their troops because the Manchu cavalry and banners are better. But by this time, also you should have your heavy ships. Uh, they should be done. So either pick beneficial fights with the Ming navy or what you actually want, sail them to where you are sieging and then do a naval barrage. It costs 50 military points. You can spare that at the moment because helping down uh, with the s helping with the siege of Xiangyang gives you an advantage to fight the Ming later on, giving you the extra fort. Another really neat thing to remember is that you have to build a spy network in the nations that you're going to attack. Why do you ask? Well, because this gives you a really sick bonus to siege ability and aggressive expansion reduction on the nation that you're spying on. Having a spy network of 100 gives you plus 20% siege ability, which means for every 5 spy network you get 1% siege ability, which is absolutely amazing and is something that you want to use as much as you can, especially in the early game when siege pips are still low and you have no artillery yet. So since your manpower will be going down the drain pretty quick, you will want to preserve manpower and, and one way to do that actually is to buy infantry, to hire uh, merc infantry to preserve more manpower which we can then use for our cavalry units. Uh, but later on we can sort of rebalance this because mercs are actually pretty expensive. Anyway in the beginning it is better to just have merc infantry. Um, it is imperative to try to fight, on f like I mentioned before, that you try to fight on flat terrain as much as possible since this will give you a plus 25% shock damage bonus for being a horde, while fighting in non-flat terrain gives you a minus 25% shock damage. If you're fighting against small stacks this is okay, but in particular when fighting large scale battles, for example against the Ming, uh, you will want to fight them in on the flats. In the end, the, the goal of this Blitzkrieg against the Ming is to take provinces all the way up to Beijing, and, and also Beijing itself. These are required to form the Qing later on anyway, and this will give you a nice boost, and it will also do serious damage to the Ming. After the second war against the Ming, you will want to take some of their coastal provinces in the south and southeast, since these can be turned into useful vassals. Keep in mind, however, to raise these provinces first, as you, do with all, as you need to do with all provinces you take. Raising those provinces will help you keep the liberty desire of your vassals in check. Also make sure that you have a royal marriage with your vassals and that their liberty desire is below 20%. Because what you will want to do is use the divert trade option, which means that these vassals will send their juicy trade power and income to you. So believe me, as a horde we want every form of income we can get. After the first war has been successful, the Ming will be weakened and upset enough that they will no longer protect the tributaries, which is really important because this gives you free reign to start conquering the other tribes and hordes as well that are around, that are, that are around you. So just take a moment to assess the situation, how strong the possible alliances are, and if, if, if those allies will join them or not, etc. And you should be fine. You, you should be fine. After or in between fighting the other hordes, you can also uh, opt to go for Korea and, 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 and expand further to the west, you know, maybe even reach Europe if you fancy. However, a final important step is to take the gold mine in Barguzin as fast as you can, as well as other gold mines as you come across them. Once you have these, you can pour all of your monarch points into these to give a huge boost to your economy, as well as spawn the institutions such as the Renaissance in your lands, which you will definitely need. So turn the uh, don't forget to turn on the encourage local development edict first, since this will save you a lot of monarch points with a 10% reduction to the, the development cost. Okay, so that deals with all of the basics that you need in order to succeed. So remember, however, that if you want to gain the Qing of China achievement, you need to actually take the Mandate of Heaven from the Ming in a peace deal. My advice for this would be to take all of the land that surrounds the Ming capital in Nanjing so that enemies can no longer get to them and that you have it in your own hands so you can, you can decide on your own when you want to strike the killing blow, uh, so to speak. Alright, so now it's time to turn to ideas and synergies. Regardless of what you pick, Manchu ideas are pretty good by themselves. 
They have a strong synergy with anything that gives extra cavalry combat ability, reduces unrest and gives additional tech bonuses. So in short, idea groups such as aristocratic, offensive, humanist, innovative and my personal favorite influence uh, for vessel gameplay. Vessels are just way too good. I like them. I love them. Being a horde, however, you have the step nomad government type, which, amongst other things, uh, gives you the ability to raise provinces for that sick monarch point gain and, and it also gives pretty good discounts to reinforcing your army and your cavalry to infantry ratio which is what being a horde is all about another really big plus is a tribal feud classes belly which basically gives you a free classes belly against the rest of the world also additionally we have horde unity instead of legitimacy so your horde unity ticks down over time due to a number of factors in short, the easiest way to keep your horde unity high is by more or less constant warfare. This also goes for your economy, which is ridiculously weak as a horde. And the only way to keep it up is by making money through warfare, raising provinces and developing gold mine provinces. <laughs> so now that I think of the having a weak economy is becoming a sort of a meme uh, now that, yeah, in my videos. Well, all good things must come to an end and we have arrived at the roundup for this, for this video. To be honest, I, I sort of have a lot of hate relationship with hordes in general. It's really fun. It's really a lot of fun to smash your opponents, raise their land, steal their gold and their monarch points. At the same time, however, you, you'll need to constantly keep a close eye on your economy, since you'll be having to juggle a lot of bankruptcy balls at the same time. So, you know, the gameplay, you're always sort of on the edge, which is fun at, at most times, but also really a hassle at other times. Other than that, however, I, I hope you will have fun trying out the games with John Zhu yourself and forming the Manchu and the Qing and conquering the world if you want. And of course, that this video was of any help. Uh, since these videos take some effort to make, however, please feel free to provide some feedback in the comments or give suggestions on topics, videos, thingies that you would perhaps like to see addressed in the future. Or of course, share it with your mates. My name is The Fisherman. Baniha for watching. And I'll see you on the next one.